Hi guys, Dane here, and today I am going to be making a start on my review of Toward Zero by Agatha Christie. So I think after this, I think I only have two more Christie books left. Uh, this is a Superintendent Battle one, so that's possibly why I've saved it, because I'm not particularly keen on battle. Uh, but I'll go through, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and read, uh, like check out some of my tabs, and I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, February 14th. There was only one person in the room, and the only sound to be heard was the scratching of that person's pen as it traced line after line across the paper. There was no one to read the words that were being traced. If there had been, they would hardly believe their eyes, for what was being written was a clear, carefully detailed project for murder. The figure sitting writing raised its head. Across the serious face a smile came. It was a smile that was not quite sane. The figure drew a deep breath. There was one thing lacking still. With a smile, the writer traced the date. A date in September. Dun dun dun! And uh, we start with somebody who tried to commit suicide January the 11th. And what's uh, interesting is that instead of like normally she just has chapters, but she has chapter names in this one. So this is open the door and here are the people. And um, he was in a state of seething rebellion and bitterness. By this time it ought to have been over. He ought to have been out of it all. Curse that damn ridiculous tree growing out of the cliff. Curse those officious sweethearts who braved the cold of a winter's night to keep a tryst on the cliff's edge. But for them, and the tree, it would have been over. A plunge into the deep, icy water, a brief struggle perhaps, and then oblivion, the end of a misused, useless, unprofitable life. And now where was he? Lying ridiculously in a hospital bed with a broken shoulder, and with the prospect of being hauled up in a police court for the crime of trying to take his own life. Curse it, it was his own life, wasn't it? And if he had succeeded in the job, they would have buried him piously as of unsound mind. Unsound mind indeed. He'd never been saner. And to commit suicide was the most logical and sensible thing that could be done by a man in his position. And now he's facing criminal charges for it. So I'm just going to read this little excerpt out here because I thought this is uh, quite interesting. Nobody's business but mine whether I threw myself off a bloody cliff or not. I'd finished with life. I was down and out. She made a little clicking noise with her tongue. It indicated abstract sympathy. He was a patient. She was soothing him by letting him blow off steam. Why shouldn't I kill myself if I wanted to, he demanded. She replied to that quite seriously. Because it's wrong. Why is it wrong? She looked at him doubtfully. She was not disturbed in her own belief, but she was much too inarticulate to explain her reaction. Well, I mean, it's wicked to kill yourself. Well, you've got to go on living whether you like it or not. Why have you? Well, there are other people to consider, aren't there? Not in my case. There's not a soul in the world who'd be the worst for my passing on. Haven't you got any relations? No mothers or sisters or anything? No. I had a wife once, but she left me. Quite right, too. She saw I was no good. But you've got friends, surely. No, I haven't. I'm not a friendly sort of man. Look here, nurse. I'll tell you something. I was a happy sort of chap once. Had a good job and a good-looking wife. There was a car accident. My boss was driving the car, and I was in it. He wanted me to say he was driving under 30 at the time of the accident. He wasn't. He was driving nearer 50. Nobody was killed. Nothing like that. He just wanted to be in the right for the insurance people. Well, I wouldn't say what he wanted. It was a lie. I don't tell lies. The nurse said, Well, I think you were quite right. Quite right. You do, do you? That pig-headedness of mine cost me my job. My boss was sore. He saw to it that I didn't get another. My wife got fed up seeing me mooch about unable to get anything to do. She went off with a man who had been my friend. He was doing well and going up in the world. I drifted along, going steadily down. I took to drinking a bit. That didn't help me to hold down jobs. Finally, I came down to hauling, strained my inside. The doctor told me I'd never be strong again. Well, there wasn't much to live for then. Easiest way, and the cleanest way, was to go right out. My life was no good to myself or anyone else. And then this nurse tries to explain why he should keep going. She says, I suppose that, and he says, I suppose that one day I may stop a runaway horse and save a golden-haired child from death, eh? Is that it? She shook her head. She said, she said with vehemence and trying to express what was so vivid in her mind and so halting on her tongue. It may be just by being somewhere, not doing anything, just by being at a certain place at a certain time. Oh, I can't say what I mean. But you might just, just walk along a street someday and just by doing that accomplish something terribly important, perhaps without even knowing what it was. And then there's this couple that basically, they're like, one of them was in a relationship before and they got together and she says, um, no life or going her. If she really cared about you, she ought to have thought about your happiness first and been glad you were going to be happy with someone more suited to you. Seems like a bit of a harsh thing to say, to be honest. Uh, so the character here, he says, uh, You could not, he admitted, take your life in cold blood. There had to be some extra fillip of despair, of grief, of desperation or of passion. 
You could not commit suicide merely because you felt that your life was a dreary round of uninteresting happenings. We get this in exchange. She's the kind that doesn't let anyone know what they're thinking. It's a pity, said Neville, that there aren't more people like that. And Mr. Treves, he says, It has been my experience that women possess little or no pride where love affairs are concerned. Pride is a quality often on their lips, but not apparent in their actions. We get this uh, little bit I wanted to highlight. Um, You've no idea what horrors most companions are. Futile, boring creatures, driving one mad with their inanity. They're companions because they're fit for nothing better. To have Mary, who is a well-read, intelligent woman, is marvellous. She has really a first-class brain, a man's brain. She has read widely and deeply, and there is nothing she cannot discuss. She is as clever domestically as she is intellectually. Be that man's brain, yeah. Then Thomas here is discussing the attempted suicide, and he says, Poor devil, I bet he didn't thank them. It must be sickening to have made up your mind to go out of it all and then be saved. Makes a fellow feel a fool. And now uh, we get something with a lift, something goes strange with that. Somebody's put a sign up and perhaps, suggested the, doc the doctor, some porter or hall boy put that notice up when he was off duty. It's an automatic lift, doctor. It doesn't need anyone to work it. It seems mad to think these days that lift operators used to be required. And I've read on the subject, actually, and it's kind of interesting because they weren't required to actually manually operate the lift. It was just that people wouldn't feel safe getting in a lift unless there appeared to be a human being at the controls. And we have a golf club it is one of the clues, a niblick, which I think is a great word. But um, they're talking about some prints there. So uh, Lee shook his head. Uh, no, not a woman. Those prints on the clubs were a man's. Too big for a woman's. Besides, this isn't a woman's crime. No, agreed Battle. Quite a man's crime. Brutal, masculine, rather athletic and slightly stupid. So Christy going ahead and rocking with the gender norms again. One of the characters says, um, it's an inside job, all right. Yes, I think so. Not that this is one of those close circle crimes, which I love the fact that Christy was using that terminology in her own work when that's what people who read her work would use to discuss it, you know? One of the characters keeps thinking about Hercule Poirot and someone else goes, you mean that old chap, the Belgian, comic little guy? Comic my foot, says Superintendent Battle. About as dangerous as a black mamba and a she leopard. That's what he is when he starts making a mountebank of himself. I wish he was here. This sort of thing would be right up his street. So it's a kind of a crossover. It shows that at least all of her detectives, or at least Poirot and Battle both live in the same world, you know? And then I thought this was funny as well. Battle basically... He does that old trick of getting all the suspects together and then one of them just spills it out what happened. And Battle goes, I'm sorry, but I had to push him over the edge. There was precious little evidence, you know. <laughs> all in all, I mean, I'd give this probably a 3.25, maybe a 3.5 if I'm feeling generous, but at the moment I'm not, so I'm going to give it a 3.25. Um, not my favourite, Christy. I mean, I never particularly enjoyed the Battle books anyway. I think, like, standalone ones, just with none of her well-known detectives intent to work better. It was alright though, and I'm glad I've ticked it off. I only have two more Agatha Christie books to read now, plus the Mary Westmacott books, but I'm not in any rush to get to those. So there we have it, that's what I thought of Towards Zero by Agatha Christie. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.